it's also the first day of the third international conference and the pop festival for youth uh, led climate actions 2021 we are delighted to have you all to join us for one of the biggest youth led uh, events for climate action and um, we are really grateful. So before we go ahead, there are actually um, some uh, indications um, for us to, uh, for this particular section. And um, so while we have uh, our panelists, while they will all be presenting the, the all we are having the presentations, please uh, endeavor to make sure that uh, your microphone uh, is actually switched off. And um, for us actually avoid background noise. Uh, please feel free to use uh, the Zoom chat to send in your questions. Uh, our facilitators will help us coordinate uh, to respond to your, your queries. Then we would also like to share our social media handles to keep you informed about our future activities. I hope you don't mind that. And um, you can also uh, find this information in the chat, in the chat box. So, um, and uh, we also actually avoid back on noise. Uh, please feel free to use the uh, Zoom chat. Oh, I'm hearing myself. Okay. All right. We can hear you. Okay, now, good. All right. So, like we said, we'll, we'll share our, all our social media handles in the chat box. And then also, um, we invite you to use our hashtags um, when sharing festival content on networks. And if you are posting anything uh, from your account, please use the hashtag uh, mentioned in the chat. And then um, also you can sign up for the special workshops um, organized by POP partners that will take place during the POP festival, which will also be available in the chat. So I'm going to put everything in the chat. And because of time management um, reasons, all questions will be asked at the end of the, of the section. Uh, we look forward to seeing you all and engaging with each one of you through the next six days of this festival. Uh, once again, you're all very welcome. And with this, um, I would like us to begin this section by inviting our esteemed panelists. We have four amazing um, experts for this particular section today, and um, it's just an honor to have them, basically. So I'd like to shed a brief, um, I'd like to shed like um, light on uh, this particular section, the, this water crisis and social section. We know that, um, Acute and chronic water scarcity has been impacting uh, billions of people in Africa, aggravating issues like poverty, hungry, loss of education and health. And therefore, there is need to look into this issue of the water crisis closely so that efforts can be made to mitigate the solutions. Sorry, this situation. Uh, this section aims to discuss the issues of water accessibility and availability in various water deprived areas. And uh, it's an attempt to portray um, sustainable solutions, um, including holistic water resource approaches adopted by the communities and interventions developed locally. So uh, moving very quickly, I would like to introduce our very first experts. Um, for this particular section. And um, that is Dr. Jessica Castro from John Hopkins, uh, Hopkins University. You're very welcome, Ma. And Jessica Castro co-chairs at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Communication Programs and uh, Climate Action Committee of Practice Grants and uh, Contract Manager. Uh, it's an honor to actually have you here. Uh, Ms. Jessica Castro has 15 years experience in international development, managing grants and contracts on project areas ranging from environment, family planning to tropical and infectious diseases implemented globally and most recently focused in Nigeria, Democratic, Democratic uh, Republic of Congo and Indonesia. Throughout her career, she has worked to marry a background in finance with a passion for the environment. Jessica has a background in international business and an MSc in environmental science and policy from John Hopkins University. She is found, she's a founding and current co-chair of John Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, Climate Action Community of Practice. In this role, she works to 
developed strategies on how social and behavior change and knowledge management practices can be applied to support communities to adopt healthy behaviors that will contribute to more sustainable environmental practices. She works heavily with donors such as USAID, BMGF, Bayer Foundation, and MEC to create more efficient financing and co-funding strategies in project implementation. She is a former co-chair of the Sierra Club School City Climate Chapter in Washington, D.C., where she worked to advocate for the city to adopt more sustainable and eco-friendly transportation methods, as well as to engage city's youth in the process. She's also the Uh, I think I think we lost Pola, uh, but can I request uh, Ms. Jessica to please uh, start the session with the keynote? Sure, Thank yes. You. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Okay, one second. I go in present mode. Yeah, it, it's visible. Can you see that? Yeah, yes. Okay, great. Um, let me just do full screen. Okay, wonderful. So thank you everybody for having me here. This is really um, exciting. I always love working with youth because you're very passionate, you're inspirational, you're motivated. Um, and I just, um, I always feel the energy when and working with um, youth. So thank you very much for having me here and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, so as mentioned, I work for Johns Hopkins School of Public Health Center for Communications Programs or CCP. Uh, what we do, um, our mission and what we believe really is that communication is fundamental um, in the human experience. And it's the key to solving a lot of the world's most pressing problems, including um, environmental health issues and climate change. So we work in a variety of areas which I've shown here, uh, mostly related to health since we're under the School of Public Health. And through our work, uh, we partner with organizations worldwide. We have projects and field offices and sister organizations in uh, 60 plus countries now. Um, we specialize in social behavior change communication or SBCC, which is what I will talk about today. And in our work, we've really noted that environmental um, health and climate action, um, oh, I gotta admit, um, really uh, uh, covers all of these areas that you see on the screen. Okay, so uh, what is SBCC? And let me see, did I skip? Here it is, I did skip one. So social, Behavior Change Communication, or SBCC, the technical definition, I'll read for you here, and then I'll go uh, explain it a little in simpler terms. But it's influencing the social norms in one's lives to inspire people to make healthy decisions and support long-lasting impacts on health and well-being through advocacy, through working with the community. Sorry, I don't know why it's skipping the front. Okay, here we go. So uh, what have we, what is it really in practical terms for you going out um, and advocating with your communities? So what we've learned really is that people are most important in the work that you do. Um, the social norms that I mentioned in the previous slide are captured in a way on this graphic at the bottom. Um, these represent the social norms. These are the unspoken rules of a society. So these are behavioral and economic issues. These are cultural or religious influences in one's life. Um, again, it's everything about your society uh, that you know about your culture that you know that others outside of that culture may not know. So uh, we've learned in our 30 plus years at CCP that the tool of SBCC or social behavior change communication is powerful because 
people are at the center of how the solutions are designed. Um, and SBC not only puts people at the center of the solutions, but it also targets each level that you see here to create change in a more holistic way so that individuals can successfully adopt behaviors and carry them through their daily life. And at uh, CCP, we really believe that communication is the way to targeting all those levels. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple projects. Um, I'm going to acknowledge that these are not based in Africa, but we thought that some of the lessons or seeing kind of the structure uh, would be helpful for you in the regions of Africa and the Middle East. So um, one of the, our largest projects at CCP was the Core Map project in Indonesia. It was a 15 year effort by the Indonesian government. Um, and it's uh, the vision that they, uh, that they wanted to carry out was to protect, rehabilitate and achieve achieve a sustainable use of the coral reefs and associated ecosystems in order to enhance the welfare of the coastal communities. Um, and what we really wanted to carry out there was through public communication. Um, we wanted to integrate that as one of the key components in, in this project to achieve that vision. So the challenge here, we first had to understand the context of Indonesia, which is always important in any area that you work in. So what is the local context? And here we knew that um, Indonesia is a, a country surrounded by water. Water is everything. It's, it's, it's a nation composed of 81% 80, water and it has 17,500 islands. So we knew it was essential for the country. Uh, the issue we faced was that uh, there was rapid degradation of the coral reefs and that the causes of this were numerous. Um, mostly there was a lack of uh, strong government. Uh, there was inconsistent legal um, and policy framework. There was inconsistent law enforcement and there was economic stress on the communities, on the coastal communities. So something we also learned, which I think carries through a lot of uh, the, um, the areas we work in is that the problem isn't necessarily public awareness. It's not necessarily that people don't know that things are happening or that there's uh, environmental degradation. The problem is that they don't know how to be involved or they can't be involved and they have limitations. So we really wanted to focus on that through our public communication. So part of this was to develop a, uh, a logo or a brand and mascots. Um, so what we did here, uh, because again, we, we wanted to involve and motivate the local communities uh, we wanted them to initiate management programs and, and design those programs. Uh, we wanted them to create the pressure on legislators and law enforcement. We wanted them to really express that it's important to them and their community. So again, we were putting people at the center and that's really the heart of SBCC. So we have the logo, the Sekirang logo. Um, You'll notice that we have the coral of that logo in the shape of a hand because we wanted to uh, convey the message that humans are really involved and are really crucial in managing the resources. And for our mascots, which are Uka and Iki, it's the, the, the fish and the coral reef. We wanted to show them very much alive because the public perception was that the reefs were dead and they, there was nothing living there. So we wanted to show them, show them the opposite of that and kind of show them a goal. So again, what is our strategy when we're working with communities to really get the messages across? And it's communication. So what we did is we, we led an integrated approach. So again, we're, we're targeting each of the different, um, those circles that I showed in that previous graphic, because again, the individual doesn't stand alone. It's really consumed within the society and the national policies. So we developed communication campaigns, which are TV and radio spots. We hosted events. We conducted training. Um, in my field, we call these you know, community mobilization efforts. So training community members and journalists. We have giveaways. You know, We make it fun. We have other materials we can hand out. Oftentimes, we hand out uh, things the community needs with the logo on it. So maybe um, reusable bags or umbrellas, things like that. 
And then we just develop special programs nationwide to, again, not only target the individual, but to get everybody on board with the same message. So we determine impact and our results through research. We have, we call baseline, midline, and endline surveys, which is just beginning, middle, and end surveys to see how we progress and what the results are. And what we determine is that through this approach of communication at all the levels um, of one's life, that the, the community was really able to begin to regard the coral reefs as a, as a resource that they need to preserve and manage. They would discuss it with family members and other community members. And where possible, they did start to uh, use more environmentally friendly fishing techniques, um, again, uh, within the, the constraints of their economic limitations. So um, what did we learn here? So again, what did we learn applying SBCC, uh, social behavior change and communication to a vision or a goal? So we, we learned that we can't just have simple awareness. So we can't just have one, one approach uh, to change attitudes and behaviors. Um, in this case, we developed a national program. You know, it could just be a state level or a city level program but they should be dynamic, they should be diverse, but the vision should be unified. And that's what we had at the beginning of this project I, or at the presentation, I read you the vision for this 15 year project. So, and then the communication should be again, diverse, it should vary, but it should have the same message, which is why we had that logo and the branding. And you don't necessarily need a logo and branding, but your message should be the same just delivered differently to reach different audiences. So, and then if, so again, if you, if you do this approach, this variant approach at different levels and you really empower the people, then you can generate social change at the larger population level and it can be sustainable. So that was our 15 year core map project. And the other two projects that CCP has done recently um, that were water related, we're on the left, we have just a snapshot of our Arcandina program, which was a television show in Ecuador. It actually won the National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Achievement Award for Best International Program. And this show, instead of um, targeting policy, we actually targeted youth and um, youth and young adults through what we call entertainment education. So developing television shows or radio broadcasts in a fun way to educate the communities to be good stewards of the environment. Um, we've also done things as simple as text messaging where, you know, if you see litter, you can text the site, or if you wanna learn more about something, you can text and receive text messages about that. So there's, again, different methods. And then we have um, our respected Ganga project on the right. So that was a Ganges River cleanup project in India. Um, I, I want to note here too that we tried the targeted approach or the integrated approach. Um, we targeted individual behavior and we also targeted policy at um, the local level. But what we learned here is that due to other challenges that even though we had this large strategy, the strategy wasn't, um, and the communications weren't carried through at each stage. And even with just one piece missing, we didn't get the full results of the project that we um, um, expected. So it's really important to make your goals achievable for the community and actionable um, in the communities that you're working with so that you're not aiming your sights too high and it's something that the community can achieve. So I just want to thank you. So that's really all I have for this session. Um, but I hope I did explain um, SBCC well, uh, that you understand what CCP does, um, and that you can see it kind of playing out in your lives and in the issues that you're facing. Um, and I hope you have learned that communication is a great tool for, for getting the results that you need and communication at various levels. And then also how empowering the people is very important and empowering, empowering community-driven solutions are incredibly important in um, the work that you do. 
So I will stop. Here. Thank you very much. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Jessica. That was very, very, um, very exact. That was so very uh, to the point. And um, I picked uh, the very key word that she, um, got to me was you said, we should make sure that our goals are achievable. And then you mentioned something on networking and connecting. That is very, very, very trivial with especially the, the youth in Africa, you know, generally. And uh, I want to say amazing uh, project you're doing. And uh, because of time, I know persons will want to connect with you on this project and they will like to ask questions on how to maybe be involved with this project. And uh, so please, uh, if you have questions for Dr. Jessica, please write it in the chat box. And then after the other presentations, we can actually like, really go straight to address these questions and your queries. So let's move on um, to the second panelist. Um, yeah. uh, so okay. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Jessica, will you stay for the entire session? If not, we can take the questions now. No, okay. I'll, I'll be here for the entire session. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. All right, okay, so we will move to the next panelist and um, that's the person of Benson, Kenda. Uh, is from uh, Sierra Loon, uh, a young water professional, innovator, and also an entrepreneur who advocates for deprived uh, rural communities uh, that lack access to safe drinking water in Sierra Loon. He's a graduate in natural science, sorry, natural resource management, and also a national youth climate ambassador for Western Area Rural District of Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, as an innovator, he developed a simple drilling equipment that can drill a bowl of 70 meter depth and also design a simple pump system made with locally available materials in one community, in more than one community. Uh, this is a simple, he developed a simple and affordable pump system with community people, uh, which community people are using to help solve the own water problems, you know, uh, which we say this is very, very beautiful. Uh, and then he is also the president of Young Water Professionals in Syria alone and uh, SDG ambassador as well. So you're welcome, Benson. Uh, please take over the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Morita. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased and happy to be here this moment. Yeah. Should I go ahead? Yes, please. Uh, you have 10 minutes, please. Can yeah. Continue. Yeah. Like, um, uh, based on the title and the topic of this particular session, talking about sustainable means or to be able to handle some water crisis. Just want to share some prior experience and uh, things that we do here in Sierra Leone, which we have been able to tackle some of those problems in many deprived communities in Sierra Leone. But one of the things we need to consider is this, the word sustainability, sustainable. And uh, most of our solutions today in Africa and some part of the world are not being sustainable. The solution in the beginning is good, but tend to become a problem at the end because most of these solutions are brought into a country or into a particular community that is being developed in another country or another development country that is no, no longer working here in Africa, any other person, any other place. Like in the area of lack of access to safe drinking water, many communities have lacked access to safe drinking water as a result of the effect of this climate change. And a lot of deforestation, a lot of sea rising, other stuff. The aquifer, the water bed have dried. Many people had to walk a long distance now from where they usually fetch the water to a stream or other places to fetch water. So what we do, we design a simple borehole drilling equipment that is locally made using a galvanized pipe where we go to a community. Now you have a community, you have a water problem, no longer your water table, your water source have got dried as a result of direct concentration of sunlight because when you cut all the trees, you allow the sunlight to directly concentrate on the soil, the water, the water level drops. So what happened? We train them. This is a normal, this is a simple technology. We train you how to drill a well. We train you how to drill a well by yourself until you reach the aquifer that we know there is enough water. And not only that, the pump we designed, we train them exactly how to do the pump and install their own pump by themselves. What we are trying to say is this: when we talk about sustainability, is using the people to solve their own problem by themselves. Why? We have seen, based on the recent survey we did, we have over 80% of those donor funded borehole projects in Sierra Leone are no longer working. They get dried at the end, they pump get problems like the India Mark IIs, Afri Dev, all these parts are imported parts. 
And when it breaks down, the community people can't afford to buy this thing on a regular basis. So they tend to ignore the pump and start working a long distance. But when you develop a solution within your own community, with your own country, you'll be able to solve that problem if any problem arises. Because those things that will have a problem, the solution is within your country. Like the pump we are using, we're using PVC pipe. And these are all available in local shops. You don't need to come to the capital city to buy a PVC pipe. You don't need to call a technician from Britain to go and fix your pump. You look around your community, you fix your pump. It's all about using a sustainable solution to solve our problem. The government and other international organizations spend something like twenty to thirty thousand dollars to do a borehole, and this is something the community by themselves cannot do except by the aid of international organizations. All right, if the international organizations have come to the aid of a particular community in Africa to do this particular system, it will work for a month or two. Then problem arise. And the thing is, the community should be able to take care of the facility according to the project. But there is no fund. The problem that will occur will be more bigger than the fund that they have already raised. And when they tend to contact the organization that did the particular project, it's another problem. They will say, we have done the project and we have handed over it to the community. So you solve a problem. So it becomes a problem at the end. So what we do, we use a simple innovative technology to drill a borehole where we involve the self supply approach. The people take responsibility of the facility and uh, they take ownership because you put in your effort, your energy, you put in your finance, not physically, but by providing food for the workers. And you also offer accommodation for the workers. By so doing, when the well is finished and handed over, you take more care of it because you put in your effort, you put in your money and whatever you need to have. So it's all about sustainable solution. Invent a sustainable technology that the people can live with, the people can use to solve their water problem. Today, we have over 78 technicians in different rural communities who have solved their own water problems and they have teamed up to build something like a business unit moving from one community to another, solving their own water problem by themselves without the help of government, without the help of any international organization, but by the help of the community themselves. And this is what we need as Africans, and not only Africans, the entire world. We look for solutions, we create solutions, grassroots solutions within our own country, our own community, our own problem. But if we spend five years sitting, look, waiting for a solution from the Western world, from another country, we still keep on suffering. We keep, still keep on waiting on the solution. When we have the time to sit down, think, and bring out innovation that will solve the problem. So this is more like what we do here in Sierra Leone. Today, we've impacted a lot of communities, a lot of lives, and people have really known that it is time that we, the young people, sit down, think, and look for solutions to solve our own problem. We have 17 sustainable development goals. Why not look for one? We have problems to access to say drinking water. Why not sit down and look for a solution, innovation? They can solve your own problem. Instead of sitting down, waiting on donor funding, government money, thousands of dollars before you can use maybe imported ideas to solve a problem that is not even sustainable. So when we talk about sustainability, it's when you use that which is available in your own country, your own community to solve your own problem. So tomorrow when problems arise, you use that particular solution to solve a problem. If we keep doing these things, we will, by 2030, we'll be able to conquer and achieve the sustainable development goal. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. That was really very nice. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, um, Benson. Uh, that was really, truly insightful. And um, I like the, uh, the ideology in the sense that um, the community will be the one to take care of the, of the dreaming well so that they can actually value it. And then they value it because they put, they put their efforts, you know, they're engaged in their old processes, right? When they provide food to the workers, then they're okay. Oh, that day when the people came to Julia, I provided food to this person. Sure. My food went for it, although my money wasn't there, but they could see all the, the they could see the old processes, they could see how very stressful it was, and then they would value it more. And I think this is a solution to us blaming the government and saying that the government should come and do it, the government should come and do it. But rather in this particular issue, we are the ones taking charge. That's very brilliant. And um, I'm sure people will have questions for you. And uh, please, let's make use of the chat box. Um, I think there was a question for Dr. Jessica. 
please, Mr. Jessica, please look into the chat box and uh, please, if you can respond to the question in the chat box. And please, if you also have questions for Benson, please ask them also by placing the chat box. And then, like you said, after this whole uh, section, we have time for questions. So, uh, moving forward, um, I hope you're enjoying this section because I'm gaining a lot. I hope you're gaining as, as much so. Uh, so, moving forward, I would like to uh, introduce. Um, Mandisa, Mandisa Makatini. I hope I pronounced the word the name very well. Uh, okay, she is a 28 years old a PhD student, researcher, uh, tutor, and author from the University of Zulu, Zulu Land in South Africa. Uh, Mandisa is passionate about um, education and mentoring junior students. Uh, I am as a senior student is to gain knowledge and impact in, into others. Our future goals are to contribute to the academic field through research and the publications, as well as to add value to the body of knowledge. You're welcome, uh, Mandisa, thanks for joining us. And then um, please, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Fonashade. Um, good morning. Good day and good afternoon to you all. Um, so based on uh, today's um, session, which regards uh, water, water crisis and um, sustain, sustainable solutions, I'd just like to just give a background of, of water scarcity um, within the region that I'm mainly familiar with, which is uh, the SADC region. Okay, so... Uh, I'm sorry, my computer's giving me a bit of technical issues. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm trying to open um, a Word document that I um, actually had here, but now I'm not sure if it's because um, the Zoom meeting is on. Uh, maybe that's why it's not displaying. Okay. You want to display your presentation? Um, I would. I actually just have a, a word, um, a word document that I had. I didn't prepare a presentation oh, per okay. se, but I think I can just share my screen if it's possible. Because yeah, please go ahead. Okay. All right. Okay, and uh, for the mm. beautiful. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you can see on your side, but it's the word document isn't showing on my side. Oh, uh, we okay. see a blank page. Yeah, okay, just a second. Let me just try and convert it to PDF. I'm sorry about this. No, it's no fine. Okay, so I'll we'll wait for you to convert. Uh, to convert to PDF, I, I really don't know if anyone wants to like, um, if you have your thoughts you want to talk about, as in to share your thoughts on the last two presentations, which is the presentation from uh, Dr. Jessica uh, and the one from Benson. Yeah, and so I have a question with Ms. Jessica actually. Um, okay. so I, I just wanted to ask, as SBCC takes like a longer time, because behavior change takes a longer time to implement or create a change. But then sometimes when you get funding, they are for a very limited time period. So um, what do you advise like for the young people who just started or their, their projects are at a very nascent stage, but uh, through climate education, they want to bring change because that's the first step. And awareness is somewhat related to SBC, SBC, SBCC only. So what is your suggestion uh, to those young people who are just starting and uh, but they're the aim for something big. Yeah, great question. I so I do want to say that um, you know the youth are incredibly important in the work that we do. So I, and I'm sure you're actually already engaging in a lot of the SBCC work. The uh, but you just don't know to call it that, right? Uh, a big component that youth. Um, uh, 
a big role that you fill actually in the SBCC process is the community mobilization. So again, as you saw in the Indonesian example, the, the need uh, is generated at the community level. And that is a, a huge role you can fill. And we do acknowledge that a lot of climate or environmental issues are really big and they can seem, you know, just too big to even tackle. And so something that youth can focus on is really small victories and, and keeping your community Focus on those small victories because every action really is a drop in the bucket. I know sometimes it can't seem that way. It's just too overwhelming, but it really is a drop in the bucket. So it's really acknowledging that and appreciating and celebrating that. And then it's through your actions and then the collective actions of, of your community that you can raise your voices up to government levels, to policy, um, to larger societal issues. You know, it's working with your faith leaders, it's working with other community leaders. So it's really mobilizing, it's coming together as youth and, and going to the people and and the higher powers within your community. And then that starts the chain up. So I think you are already doing a lot of the, the work that SBCC does. You just don't know to call it that. You just don't know to lay it out in that process. So I think, um, Part of my goal in laying it out for you was to see where you fall into that and then know that you can definitely flow it up. I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, the points okay. were quite, uh, yeah. Yes, Bola. Oh, sorry, Tisha. Yeah. Uh, you can go ahead. I just need to confirm Eva Mandisa is ready. Um, yes, I am. I am ready, thank you. Right, okay, so can I start? Go ahead. Thank you so All much right. for that. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, okay, so a concept uh, that seems to arise with most water scarcity or, or water, water, water crisis is um, discourses that uh, relate to uh, climate change. Uh, climate change is also known as environmental change. Um, it is a major concern to humans and it poses a threat to um, the current and uh, to future generations as it brings with it adverse uh, weather conditions. Uh, with Africa being the most uh, susceptible, susceptible due to um, mainly the lack of infrastructure, among other things, it is uh, further impacted by uh, devastating floods and uh, recurring drought conditions in, 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 in the recent years. And the lack of resources uh, to adapt to, to these changes uh, further oppresses uh, those that are poor and vulnerable within uh, the region and the continent. Uh, water plays a, a huge integral role in uh, the everyday lives of humans. And uh, the past century has witnessed a continuing increase, increases in water demand and water usage. Uh, it therefore becomes a major concern uh, when there are areas that experience water stresses. However, the water crisis is not uh, specific to just one region. It is an issue which is observed um, across all continents. Uh, with the focus in the SIDEC region, um, the, region the region experiences a, um, a fair amount of rainfall over its landscape. Um, though uh, it is vastly uneven, unevenly distributed. Further to that, the region has numerous water features, some being uh, transboundary, meaning that multiple countries are relying on a single water feature as, uh, as a source. An example of this is uh, the Zambezi River um, in the Sadek region, which uh, runs across eight countries. Um, this further puts a strain on the water resources in question. Uh, um, I'll just like to note that uh, there are 12 uh, member states that rely on 50 on uh, 15 water courses across this uh, across the region, and that is quite a, a huge number. Over the years, the region has made attempts to address uh, climate change and water security issues by developing protocols and uh, various strategies to try and cope with this. Uh, many parts of uh, the SADC region have been affected by water shortage uh, and climate change is noted as one of the many contributors to our, our, what the current water shortage. 
Right. Um, this uh, this has played uh, adverse uh, adverse effects on with contributing to um, aspects of life, especially by ensuring that uh, la that with the, with the livelihoods of people. Um, Water, water is mainly used for agricultural purposes um, in most parts of the region. And uh, as the population continues to grow, there becomes a greater demand uh, for food as well, uh, making the agricultural sector uh, highly, uh, hi highly in demand. And so I'd like to mention that a study notes that uh, population growth, urban development, um, farm productions, and climate change are Main, like the main uh, factors which have increased our uh, competition for um, fresh water and uh, producing uh, and producing shortages. With regards to um, the solutions or the adapt adaptation strategies, I'd, I'd like to just give my opinion or my perspective based on um, adopted from my research, which I had conducted on water shortage, shortage in a local municipality a, a few years back. I found that a few uh, a few households had said that they um, had fruits and vegetable gardens, but they faced numerous challenges um, during the uh, during the drought period, which was in 2016, uh, 2015, 16, 17, um, since they did not have access to uh, mainly tap water, and so the respondents uh, mentioned that they used water from communal taps, um, rainwater. Um, which, which can also uh, be in a form of storm harvesting. Um, they used river water from rivers and some had to walk uh, longer distances to fetch the water. Um, uh, some had to uh, reuse water. So in the form of, uh, so if they had uh, used the water for bathing, then they would also um, use that water to garden in their gardens. And that is known as um, the uh, gray water. Uh, and as well as uh, buying water, which is which plays an uh, an economic factor to them. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to mention that um, not everyone is able to use uh, modern technology when it comes to adapting to uh, to, what, to uh, the water crisis. And therefore, um, I'd like to comment that involvement uh, by local governments and local business influences would, could be uh, beneficial to community-based projects that are working towards uh, adaptation practices. Uh, that is the end of my discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mandisa. Thank you very much um, for, yeah, you gave us a broad view of um, aesthetic region and um, the particular um, the anything I think mentioned something about like 55 communities that are making use of like uh, 12 uh, water boundaries and I can imagine the stress on those communities this actually shows that uh, water crisis is really um, a very very um, and I put it very significant uh, climate change issue and um, I also want to talk about, uh, I, know, I don't know if you've heard about the, the Sahel. So in the Sahel region, uh, the Lake Chad. Yes, yes I have. Yeah. I, 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 You've heard about the diminution of the Lake Chad and all that. And I think it's something that is, most of the lakes in the most, I mean, in, in most places in Africa actually like diminishing mm -hmm. and all that. And then you also mentioned that, um, I said not everyone is able to use modern technology to, um, what do you call it, to solve this water issues. So what, what ways do you think that um, since we can, since most of this comes in the rural areas, what other ways do you think communities can actually come to solve their water issues? I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. All right. Okay, that's actually a very good question. And um, in my opinion, I believe that um, because African people have always relied on their traditional methods of, uh, of uh, doing things and adapting um, to, to situations. I think indigenous knowledge systems, so indigenous ancient methods, which they uh, could have used in farming um, in, in, in the past, maybe those could possibly help um, in a way, probably, I, I think that's what I'm just uh, thinking at the top of my head right now, but okay. um, because I mean, as I've said, um, 
technology, not everyone has access to uh, modern technology and it can be quite costly um, to, to them, to our communities. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think it's really a very, uh, a very tangible, sorry, a very significant, again, topic, a very sensitive topic that we need to really talk about. Linking it with uh, Benson's presentation with the drilling, so I'm wondering how they get financing, you know. Maybe we'll mm -hmm. talk about this more at the end of the section. And please, if you still have questions, if you have inquiries, please, because I'm trying to manage time, um, kindly put it in the chat box. So we also uh, move on to our final, but not the least experts for this section on water crisis and solutions. And uh, she's in the person of Jamila Shelley. Uh, she's uh, the former region, regional chairperson of uh, Caribbean Youth Environment Network. Jamila Shelley is an environmental advocate and educator. Um, she is current, she currently works at Barbados, Ministry of Environment and National Beautification as an assistant project coordinator in the biodiversity and conservation management program. She studied natural resources and environmental management at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels of, of the University of West Indies. During her MSA, she chose climate change as a focus where she learned about climate science, current trends and policy. She was regional uh, chairperson of the Caribbean Youth Environment Network from 2014 to 2016, sorry, 2019, pardon me. And since joining uh, CYEN, she has focused on the field of climate change through various activities like managing the world, world views, consultation on climate and energy, participating in the Action 2015 and the 1.5 Stay Alive campaign, assisting in writing statements for Caribbean youth, conducting studies on youth perspective on climate change in the region, uh, speaking about climate change and SIDS at workshops and so on. Most notably, uh, Ms. Ms. Shelley was on the national delegation at COP23 of the Climate Change Conference and the ACE Youth Forum. She was given the Queen's Young Leader Award for Environmental Advocacy and Education. You're very welcome, uh, Jamila Shelley, and um, it's an honor to have you here. So over to you, please. Thank you so much. Okay. When I was asked to speak today, I was really racking my brain on what really should I speak about. I definitely know it was about water. Um, my country, Barbados, is a small island, and it is actually one of the most water scarce countries in the world because we, the island is made out of limestone, and most of our water comes from underground aquifers. We, well, I heard in the past that we used to have many rivers and stuff like that, which would have been so great to see, but because of our extensive development, and the like urbanization of most of the island. We barely have a few streams, maybe in some of the rural parishes. So as a child, I didn't really care. I didn't really care about fixing the environment. I really love just being outside uh, because I grew, up in, I grew up in a rural area. So to me, it was just an awesome childhood, just being outside, even though we were not rich at all we were pretty poor I felt kind of rich being able to enjoy all this nature we spent me and my cousins we spent so much so much of our days just outside playing in the grass climbing trees picking fruits and my family also kept like animals and had a small vegetable garden also the neighbors shared their foods of us. That was all back in the day when I was pretty young. We also had running water. We mainly had running water, but of course there were some issues. Like in my parish, there is a water problem or there was a water problem back then and it's still happening right now. So there were some times when the water was off and then we had to go to 
what we call the stand fight. I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone calls it, calls it that, but it's like a community tap where you can get water. So we will have to go outside um, with buckets as small children and get the water and come back to the house. But I will say right now, that aquifer is now empty in the part in that parish. I, I moved to a different parish and we don't really have water water issues. So now the government has decided to build a huge pipeline from, I guess, where I live now to that aquifer to refill it. And we depend heavily on rainfall and because of climate change issues, during the dry season, there's not much rain. So we heavily depend on rainfall in the hurricane season or rainy season, which started actually in June. So if you don't get enough water during June to June to December or so, we don't know what's gonna happen with our water supply. And now onto the issue of what people, about the management of water in my country. The people generally think that it is the government's responsibility to manage water, but really and truly it is everyone's responsibility to manage how we use the water since it is so scarce. So water conservation is very important. Um, making sure that, of course, that you don't waste water is highly important in my country for sure, but people still do it. Because they say, well, uh, if, I, if I just use a little bit of water, uh, no one will care, no one be, will be affected. But then there are people that you can see you're, you're wasting the water outside. You can see them with their holes on, on, on nothing. And there are some people that cannot even get water to, to bathe or wash their clothes, to drink and stuff like that. So. I think people need to be more mindful. So that's one thing about water conservation. I also think that water harvesting is pretty important. But of course you will have to have the, the means or the, the tools to do it, such as getting a, the tank and setting up a, a, a system around your roof to catch the water. Maybe that will cost a bit of money. Or you can find more unique ways or cheaper ways to do it. I'm pretty sure people are very innovative as one of the last speakers said. There are also water conservation measures that you can add to your own house, like different types of taps, um, things for the toilet. And then you could also think about where the water goes that you use like wastewater, what do you do with your wastewater? Do you just throw it away? There's sometimes that in my house now, we, when we like boil eggs or maybe potatoes or something, we keep that water, let it cool, and then we pour it in our plant. So that's kind of our way at home to try to, to help the situation. Um, I also like to, I would say one thing that youth do is that, or that youth can do is to educate people about it. So once you learn about water conservation measures and stuff like that, you can go back to your house and maybe tell your parents, tell your family. Uh, in my family, I'm known as the environmental person. I always, I guess I'm harassing people in my family to do the right thing. So they know that when we go on picnics, bring your own plate, no disposable containers, because I will mention it. So sometimes you have to kind of be the bad guy, <laughs> but it really helps to change some behaviors when you're constantly telling people about it. 
think uh, in Dr. Castro's presentation, uh, social behavior is like the, the hardest thing to do, especially with adults. With children, it could be a bit more, it could be a bit easier. But when it comes to adults, it is really, really hard. So during my time as an environmental advocate, I have found that if you link it to their personal health, like how it affects them in their health, health ways and how it affects their pockets, then something might actually sink in. And it is something that you have to keep pushing and pushing at. So I would encourage young people to keep going. Behavioral change takes a really long time. And you doing the education is part of it, but it also has to come from the top, like the governments. So one example that's not necessarily related to water is the changing of fossil fuels fossil fuel based plastics to um, biodegradable or plant based plastic bags, um, maybe wooden for wooden utensils, etc. While those things seem like a good change, the problem really isn't solved. And the problem is actually littering. The behavioral change of littering is not solved. It's basically saying what you have to do is Sorry, it's basically saying that we're gonna let you litter, but it's just gonna be a little bit more, a little bit better for the environment, but it's not really solving the problem. So I really think that we as young people have to get together with our communities and try to change government policy. And just because you're young, don't think that you can't make a change just come in numbers, make sure that you do your research, find out what the current policies are, find things that need to be changed, link it to any multilateral environmental agreement that your government is linked to or, or is a party to, and make sure that your government um, adheres to what the rules of the conventions or so say. So make sure you come with all your information because they may think, oh, you're young, you may not, you don't know anything, you don't have any experience, but that's totally wrong. Just make sure that you research your information first and then go for it. And also as an environmental advocate, make sure that you are leading the way. Make sure that you are actually doing actions at home or in public that will show, that would just help to get people to change their mind, show them that things can work if they just change a little bit. And also don't be too hard on yourself as an environmental advocate. You don't really have to do every single thing, but just show that you're making some changes. Um. Oh, and I guess um, just to wrap up, the reason that environmental advocacy is pretty important, even though it is not your fault as young people, we came and, and found the world in a mess. <laughs> it was the people before us that did it. Don't think that it is not your place to do something about it. Because when they are gone, we're the ones that have to deal with it. So ensure that you get your friends, get some other like many people involved, come together in a group. Um, if there's no environmental groups around, yes, make your own group and try to do something. Water is highly important and climate change is really, really, really going to make a huge difference in how we move forward. I guess that's, that's my speech. Okay, thank you very much, Amina. And um, okay, uh, you, you talked um, basically about water conservation and how we can start, um, you know, immediately from our individual families when it comes to what do we do with our water waste. Then you went on to talk about educating people 
and then um, basically on um, environmental advocacy because if you most persons do not have uh, they do not have an idea about this water crisis so they're not paying enough attention to it thank you very much that was really amazing and uh, now um, I want to open the floor to everyone to ask their questions and um, but before we go ahead there's something I really want to say I feel that um, people don't really know that water crisis is um, a very very important issue because uh, water they say is life and then um, water is sorry bad water unhealthy water actually leads to a lot of uh, very very terrible diseases and infections you find out that especially even in africa and the middle east because we do not have good water most people die out of you know infection i'm sure we have come across a lot of pictures that actually depict um, children in the rural communities you know drinking muddy water and you if you see that some persons even trek like long miles you know to get that very dirty muddy water some we actually have spirogera you know swimming on top of the river and they are happy drinking it and you can imagine the outcome of when this kind of water is being drunk you find out that they have excesses maybe uh goiter protruding uh, they have uh, some people end up dying basically and uh, i can remember one time I, I come across i don't know any, any of us know about the messership messership it's um it's a voyage of uh, doctors that actually come to Africa country, you know, to um, administer uh, medicine and surgery, and su surgery to people that actually have serious health issues. And the thing is that the root of this is health issue is actually this water. And I feel people are not really, they, I don't think people really know how, how very dangerous we, we actually at risk of, um, what do you call it, or we're very vulnerable to health issues because of our lack of water in Africa. So this particular, um, what they call it, session is actually to address this vulnerability and to provide solutions. How can we move forward? How can we become um, a voice for the voiceless? Because these particular regions, you even find it very hard to even look at them. They are like in interior, interior places. So my questions for the, for the panelists is that, what, how do we get to these regions? in the Middle East and Africa? And then how do we help them to solve this water crisis? How can we take, you know, take actions? What, what organizations could do we have to call up, you know, call on to, to help us to even get, you know, to this? How can we, you know, look at organizations that can help us to get to this space? Because if you have a, if you, I mean, it's a free, it's a free section, anybody's uh, available to answer the questions. <laughs> jump in and take it's it's a hard question that you ask it's complicated um from my perspective you know we get donor funding so oftentimes we get donors like bill and melinda gates foundation and the united states agency for international development bayer foundation things like these large private corporations i know in nigeria there's a lot of um, large oil companies that are also trying to help target and mitigate some of these issues that you've talked about. And the process there, just to give you some insight, is generally they release um, a concept, you know, a, a request for a concept note. Organizations like CCP and other nonprofits write, we call it an um, a, a expression of interest. So we write back to them and say, hey, this is how I think I would solve the problem. And then it goes through this formal request for proposal. And, but as a youth, trying to think of how to invade that process. So as a youth, I think the most, I really think the most important thing you can do is communicate, connect and raise up the voices. Um, as Jamila was saying, you know, it's important to get a group together. It's important to form a group. It's important to have a consolidated voice. And it's important to raise those up to these corporations, these nonprofits. Um, so for uh, communities in very rural areas or isolated areas, there has to be some way to reach out to those areas. So if you're someone that has family there and you live in a city, maybe that's the connection. And then it's just figuring out who are the corporations or who are the nonprofits in your city or area that you can raise, 
raise those concerns up to because it's always planting that seed and that seed again if you water it with your voices and your passion will grow so it might take a while but you'll get there so you just have to get that ball rolling what, what is it like a zen saying or something where um uh every the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step so it's really mm -hmm. taking that step and not feeling defeated because maybe it doesn't see seemingly doesn't go anywhere right away. You know, it's really taking that step and being like, okay, you know, maybe in a month we'll take another step and then maybe in a month it will get there and it might not be in our lifetimes, but hopefully we will see some achievements. Again, those smaller, seemingly smaller victories, because again, these are huge issues we're talking about and huge challenges we face. And the fact that you know, you all have shown up today, this conference is going on. That's a, that's a step, you know, it might not seem like it, but it's a big step. It's huge. So. Okay. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay. Thanks. Oh, Thanks, okay. Jessica. Okay. Yes. I just want to, I wanted to also lend my voice to um, this discussion and thanks, Jessica. I think just building on what you've just said about the fact that as young people, one thing we can do is to form groups and be the voice to those voiceless people who live in the rural communities. And when we come together as groups, we can carry out advocacy to people who are in power, who are in positions of authority. For young people who are educated, who are in positions where they are influential, they can influence policymakers. I think it's it's something that we need to do to get those who are influential to come together and back this course. Because one thing I know is that many of the solutions that are required are cheap and affordable to the government. And I mean, for just $5,000, you can sink a borehole, you know, and um, Benson talked about some innovations that are going on in some communities that he is driving and his group is driving. And the question is, how can we scale up these innovations that are sustainable in the communities, that communities themselves can come together? Because one thing about communities is that they are very strong. When, when they come together and they have understanding of what they need to do to solve their own problems, they can be very proactive and they can be very um powerful in solving that solution but sometimes they just don't know what to do and so if we have these innovations that can solve problems practically the question is how do we market those innovations to those who are in authority for example in nigeria the senate the people that make the house of representatives you know for every community is 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 supposed to be overseen by a particular house of rep um, representative that is supposed to oversee and they get allocations on a regular basis to support those communities. So the question is, where does this money go? Is there a way we can market this cheap technology, these cheap innovations that are coming up that can be used to solve water problems to them to say, okay, rather than just, you know, spending this money on things that don't really matter, you can invest in this and you are sure that a lot of people living in those communities, we benefit from that. So I think young people can really, when we form coalitions and we form a voice that can really amplify the voice of those voiceless in the communities, it goes a long way to create, you know, solution for, for those who, who are living in the rural communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Madam Olushara, that's really like very insightful. And um, I keep saying it, I keep telling my, my colleagues that we, we keep, yeah, professing, okay, this is uh, the solution to this, the solution to it. Even we ourselves, we need to be involved eventually in politics. Because I feel in some, at some, some point, most of the politicians don't even have an idea about what climate change is or what um, environmental issues are actually, you know, all about. And then we eventually, as you we should start taking, you know, both steps to become involved with uh, in politics. Yeah, I, I think that should be a good idea. So that when you're there, you know, you also know how to, you know, drive um, policies that will favor, you know, things like water prices and all. Thank you very much for this insight. And um, I don't know if another person has 
any further questions, you know, or contributions. This has been a very amazing section, you know, and it's really fully loaded. Please, if you have more contributions, please go ahead. We still have like 15 minutes before the end of the section. I guess I'll say, I guess one more thing. Um, yeah. Older youth, I guess like myself, who have gone through these processes and have some experience I think that we should lend our experience like to younger people, like mentorship is so important. When I was much younger, I wish I had mentorship, things that I would give the, the younger persons because right now I personally don't want to be in the forefront. I like to push forward the younger people to get them to do the advocacy, um, go on the, the radio, the TV, don't be scared to do these kind of things. I try to help them the best I can, especially when it comes to like going to conferences, how to make the most of their experiences at these things and not, not just a goal to travel and have fun, but to actually make some kind of um, meaningful contribution as a young person. Because people yeah. where I come from don't get the don't get the opportunity too often to be a part of these international gatherings. So when you actually get the chance, you need to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, yeah, okay. And I uh, thank you very much, Jamila, for mentioning mentorship. And uh, because one thing about the youth these days is that uh, I've realized that most youth are not really very passionate. Most of them are actually either in the um, this our environmental um, space for either recognition. So I'm thinking that maybe eventually they can uh, become big shots, you know, and then they can get money out of it or something like that. But I keep telling people that uh, let your passion drive you. Let, let it be that you are really passionate that you want to save souls and everything. Not that because, oh, I'm, I'm joining this. Like, because uh, for example, now Jessica and even, um, when I'm sure you talk about us, even you, you talk about us, you know, forming groups and all that. And for example, let's say we form these groups. We have to be very sure that everybody in that group is actually passionate towards this cause and that nobody will go behind our back and then, you know, start to do what does not actually fit the group. This is, I'm sorry to say, this is an, a problem with Africans. We all know that. And this is us, we an African section. Whenever you form groups in Africa, I don't know why, I don't know if it's a spirit. It's something, something happens that somebody just, you know, tries to just, um, how do I put it, bad mouth the group or ends up, you know, losing focus. So like you mentioned behavioral change, I think it's very, very important. Behavioral change, Africans need to actually wake up to, to changing our mindsets and our behaviors. If you know you are in this particular uh, project, be passionate about it. Don't be after the fame, don't be after the money, but you know that because you want to save a life, basically. And the thing is that you're, you are fortunate to be in a, in a good environment. In the future, you don't know where your children can be found. You don't know if they really might be unfortunate to be, you know, in these very terrible zones and all that. But if today, if you can change a terrible zone or a terrible region and make it a good region, then you'd be very proud, I mean, to find your children, or you can tell your children to go and live anywhere in Africa, basically. And uh, really, I, I, I want to uh, say this should be a wake up call for all youth you know, in Africa that we should you know, have uh, a better mindset. We should have a unity amongst ourselves so that we can drive you know, the needed change. And uh, on this note, I want to say thank you all for coming. It's really a wonderful um, section. Thank you, Dr. Jessica. Thank you, Benson. Thank you, uh, Jamila. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manchester. And thank you to the organization of, the organization of this particular festival, the Pope Festival 2021. We're really very grateful. Thanks for bringing uh, this beautiful mind together. Trisha, I don't know if you have a yeah. final note for the section. No, I, I just want to thank um all the panelists and all the Sola and all the people who joined us today and you know took part in the discussion because uh, more than sharing your viewpoint it's 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 like something comes out from a discussion and I think uh, that that must have uh, be a very 
good learning experience for all those who were part of the call and also who are watching this live on YouTube. I just want to thank once again all of you. And uh, I would like to mention that we have our next session at uh, in about uh, 40 minutes on the same uh, link. So we'll have a break for next 40 minutes and we'll join you with the session on the sargasm bell, which is a, which is a very uh, like growing issue uh, in the in the at the seashore, uh, extending from Mexico towards Nigeria. So um, I think uh, most of you would love to be part of it. And yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So for connection uh, or for networking, just like our speaker said, uh, we can we can drop our handles you know, in the chat, so maybe we can connect better, especially this particular team. Who knows, maybe in the future we can decide to work on projects that will really like bring to reality, you know, all points that have been discussed today. Thank you all very much. It's nice and amazing having everyone here. And I wish you all a beautiful day. Please, we look forward to having you in the next session too. Bye for Yes, now. please feel free to drop your social media links and stay connected. Uh, also, if you post any pictures, use the hashtag Talk Festival 2021. And uh, I would like to thank all of you once again on behalf of Dr. Ash, uh, who is not there on the call right now. But I'm sure he would have been loved to be part of the call, but he's just that in a different time zone and uh, occupied with something. So thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.